Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi, and we're back with Dr. Jorge Gomez, thoracic co-oncology leader at University of Miami. Uh, we're going to discuss the management of now stage four metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. So Dr. Gomez, what do you tell a patient who has now come to you with either newly diagnosed stage four or recurrent non-small cell lung cancer? I think the most important thing for patients to know about advanced or stage four lung cancer um, is that this is a tumor that has gone outside of the original tumor site and that we can't take this tumor away from you completely. And so we are unable to cure, unfortunately, patients with stage four lung cancer, but that doesn't mean that we can't treat patients. Uh, we can treat patients, treatment helps, treatment is very important. Patients live longer and have better quality of life if they receive chemotherapy. And we have patients who live for many years with certain types of therapies. And so there is a clear benefit to treatment of stage four lung cancer compared to no treatment. In the past, uh, not treating was acceptable. Uh, not treating is no longer acceptable at this time when we have good treatments, that many of which have low toxicities. How does a patient's performance status change your decision tree in terms of treatment? So performance status is really the overall health of the patient. How much can the patient do? Are they able to walk? Are they able to get around? And are they able to function uh, in their life? Performance status is important because patients who have a very poor functional status are more likely to have side effects from chemotherapy. They're more likely to have complications from chemotherapy such as clots, infections, etc. Um, and it's a little bit more difficult to treat because it's more likely that you may worsen quality of life in a patient who is extremely, extremely weak than improving it with chemotherapy. And since quality of life is so important in lung cancer, uh, you have to make sure that you don't make it worse. How do you address pain in areas where the cancer has spread? Pain is one of the most common uh, symptoms in lung cancer. Uh, and so physicians who treat lung cancer are usually well versed in, in pain management. Um, we use many different types of medicines. Um, probably the most important medicines in, in the treatment of pain from lung cancer are narcotics because the pain from lung cancer is usually not a temporary pain. Uh, it's usually a continuous pain that we have to treat for long periods of time. Um, we have other types of non-narcotic medicines, and usually most large institutions will have a very active uh, pain anesthesia service um, where different things can be done to try to stop pain permanently, such as nerve blocks, other procedures, such as implantable pumps that can uh, continuously give pain medicine. Um, there are many things that we can do for pain, and all of them should be studied, not just pain medicines. I see. It's not uncommon that our patients are often taking alternative medicines. What are your thoughts on that, and do you allow its use along with chemotherapy? <clears throat> alternative medicines can sometimes be easy, but sometimes can be very complicated. Uh, there are many vitamins and supplements that don't cause any harm and that don't interfere with chemotherapies. There are some alternative medicines that are actually very toxic by themselves. Uh, or that may interfere with the functioning of chemotherapy. So it's very important if you want to include alternative therapy into your treatment, be upfront with your oncologist. Tell them what you want to do and show them what you'd like to use. Um, the negative part of alternative therapy is that we really don't have much in terms of clear scientific evidence that it works. That doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means we don't know whether it works or not. And so I think that Many alternative therapies are very acceptable, as long as they don't interfere with a therapy that we have been able to prove is effective. And so the number one uh, advice that I can give is speak to your oncologist. Show them what you're doing, and together come to an agreement about what can and, and maybe should not be done. I see. And do you typically use two chemotherapies at the same time, or one chemotherapy at a time for your patients? Most patients with lung cancer are able to tolerate more than one drug at the same time as a first treatment. So our standard treatment for lung cancer really includes either two or three drugs as a first treatment. In general, once the first treatment is over, uh, the second, third, and subsequent treatments usually are done with only one drug.
I see. And you alluded to more than one or two treatments. Would you please comment on the biologics that are now in use for lung cancer, for instance, erlotinib or bevacizumab or cetuximab? So we have several what we call biologics or targeted therapies. Um, although every chemotherapy is really a targeted therapy, but the newer targeted drugs really have a very specific target that we've been able to identify. And hopefully stopping that target or hitting that target can actually stop the cancer. Um, <clears throat> there are two, uh, actually there are now three drugs uh, that are targeted therapies that have been approved for use in lung cancer. The first is a drug called Bevacizumab or Avastin. That's uh, widely accepted as a first-line therapy with chemotherapy, and so a combination of three drugs in the, as a first treatment for lung cancer. Uh, the second drug is a drug called erlotinib or Tarsiva. Uh, this is a drug that is FDA approved as a second or third line treatment for non-small cell lung cancer. It's currently being investigated um, as a first line treatment in patients with EGFR mutations, mm -hmm. mutations mm -hmm. in the cancer cells that make those cells very sensitive to this drug. There are multiple clinical trials that have shown that uh, it's as good as chemotherapy for those patients, uh, and perhaps maybe a little bit better. I see. How do you address the nausea and vomiting chemotherapy? Not all chemotherapies produce nausea and vomiting, but some of the chemotherapies that we use in lung cancer do produce severe nausea and vomiting. Uh, we address nausea and vomiting preemptively. We when we start to talk about chemotherapy, we start to talk about anti-nausea drugs. And so I always give my patients prescriptions for anti-nausea drugs before I start chemotherapy so that they have the medicines ready and they know how to take them. During the administration of the chemotherapy itself, when you're at the institution getting the chemotherapy through your vein, you're also getting drugs to prevent nausea. Uh, and so we address nausea at every step. Mm -hmm. before the chemotherapy by giving medicines before the chemo, and after the chemotherapy by giving patients prescriptions to take at home. Mm -hmm. What if your patient has no appetite? How do you help them with that? Is there anything that can be done? There are several medicines that can be useful for appetite. Uh, they don't all work in all patients, mm -hmm. uh, but usually we are able to improve patients' appetites uh, with one of the drugs. The most common drugs are uh, or probably the most common drugs, one is a drug called Megase or Megastrol. Um, that is usually given in a, uh, as a liquid taken once a day. Uh, it's a steroid and it actually helps in many, many patients, although again it doesn't work in some patients. Mm -hmm. The second drug is a drug called Marinol, mm -hmm. um, which can also work. That's usually given before meals because its effect is fairly rapid and short-lived, so it's given before meals to try to improve appetite before meals. I see. <clears throat> How do you assess to see whether your treatment is working? Do you follow tumor markers, CAT scans? What do you do? Lung cancer is a little bit of a tricky cancer uh, for assessing the response to chemotherapy or to treatment because uh, there's no outside tumor that we can follow. Usually we don't have a tumor that we can measure, either on the chest wall or somewhere. So the most important thing that we do to follow tumors is uh, radiographic imaging, and probably the most important is a CAT scan of the chest <coughs> or the area that's, that's affected. Um, many tumors have good tumor markers that you can follow. In prostate, for example, you can clearly follow PSA to gauge what's happening with the tumor. In lung cancer, unfortunately, we don't have good markers in the blood that we can use. There are some old markers that have been used, but they're not really very effective at, at following lung cancer. How do you address a very difficult discussion of whether something is curable or not, and how do you remain positive but at the same time realistic? I think that it's important, it's very important for patients to know what the outcome of their treatment is going to be because they're going to make that decision of whether or not they're going to have treatment. <clears throat> so knowing whether or not they can be cured is extremely important. And so I address that up front. Mm -hmm. On the first visit, I feel it's my responsibility to, in a nice way, tell patients that we will not be able to cure their cancer. Mm -hmm. 
because we know that for patients with stage 4 disease, or for most patients with stage 4 disease, their cancer is incurable. Um, I can't tell a patient how long they're going to live because I don't know. I can give patients statistics of how long averages are, uh, but I don't generally use those because, again, I don't know what's going to happen in any individual patient. And so giving them some numbers that don't really mean anything to them on a personal level I think is a, is not a is a disservice. Mm -hmm. um, so if patients insist, I give them the statistics, but I don't want them to say that's what's going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. um, but again, so the fact that you cannot be cured should be addressed up front, so that patients can make informed decisions about whether they wish to get treatment at all. Mm -hmm. What if has a family member ever asked you not to discuss the diagnosis with the patient, and how do you address that? Family members often ask. Uh, physicians not to discuss diagnosis or prognosis with the patient. Um, diagnosis has to be discussed with the patient. There's no way to treat a patient with cancer without having that patient know what they have. It's not fair to anyone uh, not to know because if you don't know what you have, you cannot make an informed decision about the treatment. And so all cancer patients need to know that they have cancer. How much a patient knows about the prognosis is a little bit different. I think that it's more important for a physician to gauge how much the patient wants to know. And if the patient wants to know everything, the patient needs to know everything, whether the family wants them to know or not. Mm -hmm. If the patient gives you a sense that they do not want to know, then there is no need to push that information on the patient. You may actually want to give that information to the family so that the family knows what is likely to happen. But if a patient refuses the information, then I don't feel the need to push it. I see. What, you know, what if the cancer has spread to other parts of the body? Is there a role for surgery to remove all the lesions? There are certain patients where surgery can actually help, um, even in patients with very advanced stage 4 disease. The most important example is probably patients with metastases to the brain. Mm -hmm. There are many patients with a single or two metastases to the brain and very early disease in the chest that can be treated with surgery and might be cured. Most patients are not cured, but there are many, many patients in the literature that have been cured with early stage disease. Mm -hmm. Those patients have to be chosen very carefully because the procedures are big. Having part of the lung taken out and having part of your brain taken out are large procedures. You don't want to do them if you have a very high chance of having cancer within the next three or six months. Mm -hmm. And so you have to choose the patients that, that have the lowest risk of having a recurrence. And those are patients with early disease in the mm -hmm. chest and one or maybe two metastases in another area, the brain, the adrenal gland, and those are really probably the, the, the mm -hmm. most important. Okay. Would you please comment on some of the bone protecting agents that we use, such as bisphosphonates and denosumab, and what role do they play? There are multiple agents that can help prevent bone fractures. Bone fractures are common in patients with lung cancer because bone metastases are common in patients with lung cancer. Uh, and so patients with multiple bone metastases should receive one of these agents. Mm -hmm. It's not clear whether one is better than the other. There are some that might be more potent than the other, but they can all prevent fractures in patients, and really that's, that's the goal. Um, fractures such as hip fractures in patients with cancer are catastrophic. They can be devastating because they can actually put patients in a bed for many, many months while the tumor continues to grow and no treatment is, is able to be done. And so anything we can do to prevent fractures is very important. No, there's a, there's a trend towards what's called maintenance therapy in lung cancer. Would you please explain what that is and what are your thoughts on that? In the past, uh, most therapies for lung cancer were fairly toxic, and so we were able to give four or six of what we call cycles of chemotherapy, um, and then we really had to stop or else we started decreasing the quality of life of patients. We started giving them so much in terms of side effects that there was no benefit to chemotherapy. And there really had not been a benefit in survival in continuing the chemotherapy. So if we can't make you live longer and we give you more side effects, there was no point in continuing chemotherapy after four or six cycles of chemotherapy, which took anywhere between three to five months. More recently, there have been 
several drugs, three drugs, that have been shown to improve survival when they're continued after your first four to six cycles of chemotherapy without worsening quality of life. And so now it is fairly standard in lung cancer for most patients to receive some sort of maintenance therapy mm -hmm. since we have been able to show an improvement in survival for all types of patients with non-small cell lung cancer mm -hmm. with one of those three drugs. Mm -hmm. What about clinical trials? Do you recommend that your patients go on clinical trials? Clinical trials are very important <coughs> in all types of cancers. Mm -hmm. um, clinical trials test new drugs and so there are patients who have been through all of the standard drugs and in lung cancer to us that happens very frequently. Mm -hmm. We run out of the standard drugs. Without clinical trials, we have no more treatment options. There are, however, clinical trials even for a first treatment. There are clinical trials that include the standard treatment plus a new drug, plus a new investigational drug that might actually make the treatment even better. And so it's important to participate in clinical trials throughout the treatment of lung cancer, as a first, as a second, or as a third treatment. Um, if there is a, a thought that that clinical trial may have a benefit for that patient. Clinical trials are not beneficial for every patient. I see. What are your thoughts regarding palliative care in hospice uh, for your patients with stage four non-small cell lung cancer? In lung cancer, that is a very important issue because patients can have a lot of symptoms. And so for us, palliation <coughs> isn't something that happens at the end of the treatment. It's something that happens at the beginning of the treatment. Uh, we start to palliate from day one. Our chemotherapies are palliative because they improve symptoms. They take away pain. They improve breathing. They make patients feel better. And so for us, palliation isn't part of a terminal event, uh, but rather something that can actually improve the quality of life of the patient from the first day. Now, it is a sad reality that many patients with lung cancer will die, um, and it's important to know when to not give further chemotherapies. And the moment to do that is the moment where your chemotherapy will actually worsen quality of life rather than improve it. Um, it's very hard from the perspective of a patient or a family member to hear that a treatment may actually make things a lot worse mm -hmm. or has a higher chance of making things worse than of making things better. But if you hear that from your doctor, it, it's probably true. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very important to think about perhaps no longer receiving treatment for therapy mm -hmm. and treating only the symptoms, trying to continue to improve quality of life without chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Gomez, for your time. We hope this has been educational for you. Thank you for watching.